Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining the Health First podcast. We are so happy to have Dr. Scott Cohen and Dr. Fiona Collins with us today, speaking about superbugs under a microscope, part one. In this podcast, we will be discussing what superbugs are and explain examples of some, including the origins and the resistance. We'll review overuse and misuse of antibiotics in healthcare, some of the factors or reasons for the overuse, for overuse including the impact on mortality and antibiotic stewardship. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Scott Cohen. He is a practicing physician at Bassett Healthcare Network, and Dr. Fiona Collins is an infection prevention expert. Scott, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Marcy. Uh, so as Marcy said today, we're really gonna focus on superbugs, maybe not necessarily under the microscope, but uh, we're gonna put them under the microscope by talking about them and, and where they come from. So first of all, you know, we all hear superbugs and we remember there were articles, I think it was in Time Magazine years ago. Um, and you know, but what are some of the bugs? Where do they come from? You know, why do we call them superbugs? What does that mean? You know, um, in my uh, medical practice, when I'm, especially when I'm talking to younger people and teenagers, you know, I like to give them a lot of examples of things just to, like, you know, when I'm talking about prevention of illness. And in this case, there are so many different, uh, these bugs out there that, you know, people are just amazed when we talk about them. So for example, you know, MDR-TB, multidrug resistant TB, MRSA, which most people have heard of, CRE, VRE, Canada auris, resistant gonorrhea, VRSA. I realize that's an acronym salad, but the reality is there are dozens more than that out there. Even things like uh, Clostridium difficile, which isn't resistant, but is caused by antibiotic overuse. So in general, if we look at superbugs and we try to put a, you know, a terminology on it, a definition on it, we would probably say that they're bugs that are resistant to, to traditional treatment. Most of the things we're gonna be talking about are uh, bacterium. So we're talking about anti, antimicrobials, antibiotics. So typically when we talk about a superbug, we're talking about bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics. Maybe not all antibiotics, but are certainly resistant to antibiotics. For example, some MRSA are resistant to so many different things, people need to be in the hospital. And some MRSA are found in the community and we can just use a different antibiotic. So I guess, you know, the question that we always have to ask is where, you know, where does antibiotic resistance come from? You know, what's the origin of it? And there are many origins and some of them we don't even understand. And Fiona is going to talk about some later that, you know, we have very little understanding about like Canada auris, uh, which is uh, not a bacteria. It's actually, um, you know, in the family of the yeast. Um, but there's things like overprescribing, and we know both in um, you know animals as well as humans, there's been a lot of over overprescribing. There's been a history of putting antibiotics in agricultural feed because it does make animals bigger, grow faster, and thus uh, financially uh, benefits those who are growing animals. And interestingly, if you think about why this happens, so antibiotics then will kill off those bacteria that are not not resistant those uh, bugs that are resistant to it, they are the ones that hang around and flourish and then become more common because you're not able to kill them. So you're actually selecting for that. Um, so, you know, as we move on in this talk, I'm gonna pass it off to uh, Fiona Collins now and uh, try to talk about some of the reasons behind, you know, where we get some of this resistance from. So Fiona. Thanks, Scott. If we start uh, with antibiotics that have been used in ag agriculture, people often think that that was the minor part of the issue, but in fact, uh, the overwhelming amount of antibiotics that were being used were used in agriculture. Um, Scott, you'd mentioned being routinely given to livestock, but it, it's actually fish as well for non-therapeutic reasons, speeding up growth, gaining weight, which of course is a production uh, goal and obviously has a positive financial impact on the uh, farmers or the factory farm. And if we look at a report in 2012, 88% of growing swine were fed antibiotics, not for a therapeutic reason, they weren't ill, simply for this purpose of increasing growth. Uh, the, uh, by 2014, of the 25 million antibiotics that were uh, prescribed or sold that year, 20 million of them, four fifths, were actually used in agriculture. So it was a huge problem. Wow. They were also used for all dairy cows to prevent mastitis, 
So an inappropriate prophylactic use from that perspective. And uh, they were used to control mastitis as well. They were also used in feedlot calves. And I know around here, there are some feedlots. Some when we were house hunting years ago, we wanted to make sure we weren't anywhere near a, food lot, a feedlot. And so they're given to those calves for respiratory disease. The good news is the FDA did implement a directive and a guidance, the first in 2015 and the second in 2017. So from that perspective, there's now veterinary oversight and, and um, their use for production purposes for weight gain and growth is now prohibited, it's, it's completely banned. But the other problem we don't think about in relation to agriculture is what happens to all that manure? Well, it's spread back on the fields if it doesn't stay on the fields. It can then leach into the groundwater. So you're, you're furthering contaminating the water as well, which contributes to it. They can become airborne in arid areas, the bacteria. And farm workers have been found to carry resistant Staphylococcus aureus home with them from the farm environment. So there are lots of additional problems that there, therefore happen with respect to agriculture. It is now in uh, much better shape than it was. And there's still a plan with the FDA that started in 2019 um, to further solve that issue. Uh, but maybe now we could talk a little bit, Scott, about uh, overprescribing and misuse of antibiotics in healthcare, so medical and dental. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, we were talking about this before, Fiona, and I, I guess I'm impressed by this is one of those areas in medicine and dentistry where we overlap between, you know, I'm a physician, you're, you're a dental specialist, and, and it's amazing how we've all contributed this to, to this together. So think about, you know, years ago when we used to prescribe antibiotics prophylactically for, you know, mitral valve prolapse. Oh, and by the way, you know, our, one of our future episodes, uh, I think actually coming up next, uh, we're going to talk about the AHA and ADA guidelines for uh, SBE or bacterial endocarditis prophylaxis, as well as, you know, artificial joint prophylaxis in the dental setting. So uh, do me a favor, I'll please look forward to that. Um, but that, that's an example of an appropriate use of antibiotics as long as it's used appropriately according to the guidelines. But I can say from the medicine perspective, we've had a lot of inappropriate use, so much so that the CDC has implemented a careful antibiotic use or antibiotic stewardship program. Um, but I think things like colds and early you know, nasal infections that people are calling sinusitis, but really aren't, bronchitis, which is 90% viral, you know, and probably shouldn't be used, but I don't know, what, what are some of the examples from the dental arena, uh, Fiona? So it's interesting, there are examples where uh, people have been going on vacation and they've been prescribed antibiotics, often because they requested or demanded them, but either way, they've been prescribed antibiotics in case something flared up while they were on vacation. So for example, um, an abscess that hasn't yet been treated or the patient won't have treatment, that's ha that happens too. Um, or root canal treatment has been provided very recently. And so they walk off with the prescription in case they have any problems. So uh, that's one of them. Uh, another one is routine prescribing still occurs uh, for extractions of wisdom teeth. So that would be prophylactic extraction. It's also used of course for dry sockets. Um, and then you, during uh, implant therapy is another um, practice where antibiotics are provided. And there are other uses as well. Um, some of them actually, uh, one that was found in the research when they started looking at the reports was prescribing antibiotics for um, acute apical abscesses. It doesn't do anything for acute apical abscesses. It's um, not a useful use of antibiotics. Um, but I think some of the other um, issues that arise are common to medicine and dentistry. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting you say that, you know, and, and also about, you know, people demanding antibiotics. We, we've had a, we had a lot of that in medicine up until let's say 10 or 15 years ago when, you know, physicians and other medical uh, professionals really started, you know, pushing back and explaining to people that antibiotics are not benign, including, yes, as a society, we know they're not benign, they create superbugs, but even in the individual, they can cause antibiotic associated colitis, you know, um, allergic reactions, you know, multiple other things. And, you know, I think people are much more accepting now in the medical arena of saying, you know what, this is probably not something that will improve any more with antibiotics than without. Let's wait it out, use symptomatic care, things like that. Um, I think society is starting to hear that message. It's still a problem and it's still some people who demand antibiotics and it's a very difficult discussion. 
And it's yeah. a difficult discussion in the sense that it takes time and all of us in medicine and dentistry are time pressured. Um, is, are there examples of that in dentistry or is that more a medicine issue? Uh, no, it's a dental issue. It's our dentistry issue as well. And certainly there's time pressure and patient demands. Uh, so patients, um, dentists were reporting they were actually fearful and it wasn't just in the US, it was elsewhere as well of refusing an antibiotic because they thought the patient might not come back. Um, and they might not have treatment. So that was one aspect of it. Um, the other aspect, of course, was the same time pressures. Um, I agree that now patients are more understanding and, and that's part way down to uh, public health messaging, but it's also down to the discussions and the messages that healthcare professionals have been conveying. Um, public health, um, important. And I think occasionally you'll see a report of somebody who had colitis following antibiotic use. And one of them, I, it was stuck in my head. It was an 18 year old young woman and she had been given antibiotics. She needed them, but she was given antibiotics and uh, she ended up with colitis that was so severe and intractable that she ended up with a colostomy at 18 years of age. Wow. And I think things like that really, really stick in your mind. Yeah, they really do. And, you know, I think you're bringing up the impact of, you know, inappropriate antibiotic use, antibiotic use or overuse as we like to call it. You know, and, and I looked up some of the impact and the last data I could find were uh, from 2019, the CDC published this and they were saying that there's about 35,000 deaths, 3 million illnesses and billions in excess uh, healthcare costs just in 2019 related to this issue. And, you know, if you think of indirect costs as well, like lost time from work, it's probably billions more than that. It really is, it really is crazy. Um, yeah. Fiona, any specific examples of, of superbugs you want to talk about briefly in the one or two minutes we have left? <laughs> Very briefly in this episode. Uh, I think one that we're all familiar with is MRSA, and uh, it's really widespread throughout the world. Um, if we look at the U.S. alone, there were uh, more than 300,000 cases in a year and actually more than 10,500 deaths. I think people often don't associate MRSA with deaths, but it, it happens. Mm -hmm. uh, the other one you briefly mentioned earlier, Scott, of course, isn't related to antibiotics. It's related to fungal medications. And that was Candida auris. Yeah, it, it, Candida auris does scare people, me included. Um, MRSA does cause death in some people. I've had some experience with that in my hospital practice as well. It's unfortunate. So I think our goal here today really was to explain, uh, you know, about what are the issues and then ask for appropriate stewardship, meaning, you know, use antibiotics appropriately and, you know, try to have all of us do what we can as medical professionals to, um, you know, prevent any further uh, emergence of resistance. And, you know, as we said, we'll, we'll be doing in our next episode, I believe, um, SBE prophylaxis or bacterial endocarditis prophylaxis guidelines from the AHA and ADA, as well as joint prophylaxis guidelines so uh, we hope you all will join us for that and really appreciate you coming today to uh, listen to Fiona and me chat about uh, superbugs. Have a great night.